Hey everybody, Mario Dennis here with the Keeping It Real Estate podcast and today my guest, he is actually a really good friend of mine, Mr. Corey Charles. How are you, Corey? I'm doing fantastic, sir. How are you? Good. We've been trying to do this for like four months and finally uh, we were able to line it up so that we can do it. You're a really busy dude. I, I take the blame. That's me. <laughs> um, and you're always flying everywhere. Um, tell us a little bit about your trajectory and your line of work and uh, where your career's at now. So uh, how far do you want me to go back? Because we could, we could I be here all day. Listen, we, we, we <laughs> don't have a time limit, so go. Um, so I'll tell you, right now I'm working with Apostle Tech, and we are a Salesforce implementation partner. Um, so we handle uh, those implementations for Salesforce, specifically in the new home space uh, for new home builders. Uh, we got linked up with them through Taylor Morrison, my firm, former employer. And what did you do for Taylor? So for Taylor Merson, uh, I originally started on the sales floor um, and then got plucked into the corporate sales training role um, and then eventually moved into the national sales trainer. I, I like that. I got plucked. Plucked, yes. <laughs> um, why did you get plucked? I know uh, why I think you got plucked, but why <laughs> do you think you got plucked? I, I, I'd love to see if they meet up. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, and, and uh, I'm going to shout out my, my mentor and my friend, Abby, and she loves when I say this, and when I call her boss, she hates when I say that. But um, when I started with Taylor Morrison, I'd done some training in the past. You know, as you know, I come from the auto industry. And I started with Taylor Morrison, and I knew that I still had the passion for training. I just wasn't sure if I was ready to jump back into it. Um, I, I was kind of in that sales mindset. Um, and what I've learned is when you're, when you're a trainer and you're a salesperson, those are two different mentalities. So I was in that very much that salesperson place. Um, and I went to her, she was the, the, you know, the sales trainer there at Taylor Morrison. And I started uh, in her sales training class and I could just feel the energy and I could feel the vibe. And I said, okay, this kind of fits along with what I like to do and what I think, you know, training is all about. Um, and I famously told her, you know, she asked me what my, what my plans were. And I said, well, uh, you know, I'd like to have your job. <laughs> <laughs> and she didn't kick me out of the class, which was an amazing. That's thing. good. Uh, she didn't kick me out. And I think she kind of kept an eye on me, uh, and gave me, gave me a list of things that I should do, you know, in the meantime to, to get myself prepared for the role. And, and when the opportunity came up, she plucked me. Um, what do you think are some of the things that are different between the sales mentality and that trainer mentality? Um, I'll tell you the biggest thing, and this was a hard lesson that I had to learn early on in my sales career, um, and this is not in, in a negative way. It's just a different way of thinking. Um, as, you know, as a salesperson, inherently we think about ourselves. You know, it's about my next sale, my next commission. It, it, that's just the way we have to be wired, right, to be successful. Um, but as a trainer, it's, it, it's almost like you're the last thing. It's, it's about how can I help the next generation? How can I help the next person? How can I get the next uh, crop of talent to the next level? So it, it puts you very much in a teacher mindset. Um, and that's a, that's a lesson that I had to learn early on in my, in my sales career. Uh, I'll tell you a quick story. I had a, a good friend of mine that was also a salesperson, and we competed for the same, same uh, t spots on the charts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he would, he would smoke me every month, and I just couldn't understand it. Um, and, and he just kept beating me, kept beating me. And it was something that, you know, I'm highly competitive, so that bothered me. Um, and one day, we had one of our new newer hires come and talk to me and said, hey, I'm having a problem with this customer. Uh, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to get them over the hump. And, you know, I instinctively said, hey, do you want me to come talk to him? I'll, I'll help you out. And I went and talked to him. And I spent, you know, 30, 45 minutes with the customer kind of helping that new person. And I had him tag along and watch what I did. And, and it just as a thing that, you know, we would often do. Sure. And, you know, I helped him through the process. And he was like, oh, that was so great. Thank you so much. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, a couple weeks later, I saw a similar situation. And that other salesperson that I was competing with said, I, I, I really don't have time for that. Mm -hmm. I got to go take another customer. And then the light bulb went off. Like, oh, okay. If I multiply that by how many times I'm helping out, that's the difference in the gap that I can't close. Yeah. So it, number one, it made me feel better about myself that I'm not a terrible salesperson, but also it made me understand my mindset is more about helping others. Yeah, that's that's an interesting distinction because I think oftentimes salespeople also, they'd like to compare themselves to other people, but those comparisons are rarely ever on a level playing field. For you, it was because you were spending time training people um, in real estate, we see that a lot because everybody's an independent contractor, so everybody's kind of like not very structured doing their own thing, you know, and people are like, oh, man, this person is selling $6 million. I'm only selling $2 million. Well, 
you know, if you really looked at it apples to apples, maybe they work three times as many hours as you. Maybe they make four times the amount of calls that you do. It's mm-hmm. really, it's really hard to create those comparisons between um, salespeople because it's rarely ever apples to apples. For sure, we still do it though. Oh yeah, for <laughs> sure. Um, so it, you know, it's interesting. We scheduled to do this like three weeks ago, and then you know we hear on Sunday what happened to Kobe, and. The immediate reaction that I had is, you know, we've bantered a lot about basketball in mm-hmm. the past, and I know that Kobe was your absolute top number one idol in the planet. Um, and so I was kind of like a little bummed out at first, but then I, I figured, like, we can use that for some lessons. W- what was that like for you? How did you find out about it? How did you process it? Uh, you know, And explain people a little bit, like, w- kind of like what, you know, this kind of drives me crazy, and I don't mean to go off in a tangent, but it Please drives do. me crazy that everybody thinks that everybody should look at one person the same way. Like, you know, maybe you don't have a connection to this particular person, but, you know, someone like you had a connection to him. Um, can, can you elaborate a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. And, and one of the questions I always get is, you know, a- as you know, I'm from New York, and a lot of people find it strange that I'm, you know, this huge Kobe fan. <laughs> um, but what I always tell people is growing up, my brother, my older brother was the biggest Lakers fan I could imagine. And he was always my person that I looked to, to was my big brother. So I wanted to be l- like him. So when I grew up and I started getting into basketball, I, you know, I kept an eye on the Lakers and Kobe was that player, you know, you know, obviously y- you can speak to the greatness of Jordan, but Kobe's that player that I got a chance to see from beginning to end. Mm-hmm. You know, I got to see the whole breadth of his career and see him change as a player, see him change as a person. And not only his style of play did I fall in love with, um, but his work ethic is something that I ha- I hold really, really, really dear to me is that, that work ethic, that drive, that motivation. And to see him then transition to a whole nother level outside of basketball and see him inspire other players and and challenge them to be great and be better than they are and and push themselves past their limitations that it, it's something that uh, you know to your point i think it goes well beyond basketball you know I, I think it's about life and it's about making the best out of every situation and 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 being the hardest working person in the room so um you know it's one of those moments where you know when that happens, it's surreal. You, you, you immediately, especially in today's era of social media and, and, you know, fake news, you hear something like that and your instinct is like, oh, that's not real. Right. And then as time goes on, you, you, it almost becomes you're, you're wishing it yeah. to not be real. Yeah. You're, you're believing it, but you're wishing that it's not real. And I remember I had a friend send me a message, you know, oh my gosh, you know, this just happened. And my, snap reaction was anger and i thought to myself that's not a funny joke right 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 that's not something to joke around about um and then as i started doing the research now i'm almost frantic doing the research and as the information starts coming out it starts to hit you and it's just something that makes you you know you look you go home you look at your kids differently you, you 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 think about uh all kinds of things differently for someone like myself you know i'm i'm on an airplane almost every week you know and i heard the story of kobe saying the reason why he flew that helicopter so often or flew in the helicopter so often was to be able to spend more time with his kids. And that's something I can totally relate to. Yeah. You know, you know, I take a lot of midnight flights to come home and yeah, a, a, lot sure. of, a lot of overnight flights to, to spend as much time at home as possible. So that's something that really hits, you know, on another level, really, really close to home. Yeah. It's, you know, that I think one thing that you mentioned before we started the podcast is you, you feel more vulnerable after something like that happens because you know here's your childhood hero gone at 41 like absolutely you're gonna you know it's one of those things like by all measurable accounts or 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 more likely than not you are gonna live longer than him and that's a crazy thing to think about your heroes right absolutely absolutely it's just like i said you know I, i spoke to my mother and you know just like you said everyone around me knows that that was you know my my guy so uh, my mother called to check on me, and I, I told her, you know, I feel very mortal today. Yeah. Which, you know, to your point, y- you look at your heroes and your idols, you know, with or without their imperfections, but you look at them as people that are invincible. And to have something happen, like you said, at 41, which it's not very far away. No, especially <laughs> not in this day and age. I don't know if it's because I'm getting older <laughs> and I get more optimistic, but, um, 
when I was growing up, there was not many 41 year olds that looked like Kobe Bryant did at 41. Amen. <laughs> um, so it's like, you know, 41 is a baby, yeah. you know, by all um, intents and purposes. Um, you know, the thing that you, that's interesting to me about how something like that happens, like, you know, the first thing that I thought about was, you know, I think since Michael Jackson, this is arguably the biggest death that we've had, you know, sort of like a superstar status. And before Michael Jackson, I can't even imagine. And you could argue Michael Jackson was almost like self-inflicted. Yeah. And one difference is like when Michael Jackson died from an overdose, I don't think there was anyone that was like, really? <laughs> Most people were like, eh. Yeah. It was bound to happen. For sure. You yeah. know? And, and, you know, the Kobe thing is like totally unprecedented. And, you know, again, I think athletes, you can say, as far as recognizable athletes in the world, you have like... Michael Jordan, Shaquille O'Neal, Tiger Woods, Kobe Bryant. Mm -hmm. Like, maybe not in that order, but those are the four guys that they can go to China, to yeah. Italy, to Russia, to Africa, South America, and everyone would know who they are. Um, so, you know, I, I was thinking about that. Like, you know, there hasn't been anyone like him. Like, we don't, there, this is unprecedented. But then the other thing that starts happening in social media is extra interesting, right? Because... People, um, I feel like you have two camps. You have the camp of people that want to go along with whatever's going on, like maybe the people that didn't know who he was, but like, you know, feel the need to be heartfelt about it. And that's okay. Everybody grieves differently, I guess. But then you have the people that want to harp on those flaws mm -hmm. and say, oh, this guy wasn't perfect. This guy did this, you know. I don't understand why people are grieving this guy. He was such a piece of shit. Like, you see stuff like that, and, and then I'm like, Christ, like, yeah. and that's that's the tough part, right? You know, at the end of the day, we're all humans. We all make mistakes, and whether you like him, you know, I, I talked to a friend who was a diehard Celtics fan, and, and you know, in the sense of basketball, hated Kobe. Mm -hmm. But what was one of the first? Likewise, ones? yeah. I mean, never a fan. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the first <laughs> ones to reach out, you know, and 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 talk about, you know, it, it's beyond basketball. It's you know, this is you're talking about a husband, a father a brother, a son, you know, a person and, and someone that spent, especially, you know, post basketball, spent his life trying to educate and inspire and motivate people. Um, and I think if the bar is that we can only be celebrated in our passing, if we're perfect, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a bar that none of us are going to reach. Right. You know, right. I, th I think, I think that's what people really need to kind of, um, I hope people can concentrate on that a little bit more. I think social media is still brand new, right? Like, mm -hmm. How long has Instagram and Facebook been around? You know, like 14 years ago, that wasn't a thing. So mm -hmm. literally it's a, f it, you know, the, especially in the scale of human history is a minute amount of time that we've been sort of playing with this super powerful toy. Mm -hmm. And so obviously we're bound to make mistakes. People don't really know how to handle this, but, um, but you know, this assumption that everyone should grieve the same way or that, you know, I think grief and outrage, all those emotions are selective. I think this idea that, oh, no one is, you know, I don't know why people are mourning this guy, but they're not mourning this other guy. Mm -hmm. Like, you see that a lot. Like, well, because I choose not to, mm -hmm. you know, because you choose to mourn the people that are um, closest to you, the ones that have affected your life, the ones that um, have sort of shaped you in any way, shape, or form. Um, you know, but this idea that, that that there's some that is disingenuous to grieve someone if you choose not to grieve other people like are we going to grieve every death <laughs> on the planet like that would be exhausting well that's like expecting you to grieve the death of my dog that you never met right and i think you're a bad person because you're right. not grieving my dog yeah and it's just it's it's unrealistic yeah i i think a little empathy um it definitely would go a, a, a long way listen I've always criticized, you know, the idea that when people pass, they're perfect, mm -hmm. you know, and I lived this firsthand when my dad passed away, you know, one of the first sort of uh, things that I kind of mindsets that I put myself in after that happened was, I'm not going to be that person. Um, my dad was not perfect. He had his flaws. I mean, he was amazing, but I'm not going to cover up the fact that he was a normal human with normal flaws. Um, and so I, you know, I, I get peeved when people make someone out to be perfect, but, but, you know, 
that doesn't mean you you turn it around and you go the 180 degrees opposite and all you do is harp on the imperfection. Mm-hmm. Especially people that have a magnifying glass over their head forever. Absolutely. You know, like this, I say the same thing uh, about Kobe that I would say about the president that would say about anybody. People that have a magnifying glass over their head, I don't know what that's like, but I guarantee you if someone was over my head, you know, with a magnifying glass, they would also find things that people would find appalling. I'm sure of it, you know, because everybody has done something stupid, I guess. And not to mention what's, what some find appalling, that's all subjective. Right. So, you know, like, well, and, and especially when we're talking about someone dying, yes, like the death penalty is something that's controversial. Mm -hmm. It's something that it's only used for the most heinous of crimes. And by the way, I'm a proponent of it for those heinous crimes. Mm -hmm. But this idea that, you know, if somebody did a misdeed in the past, whatever that might be, that means they should die. Oh, yeah. Like I, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not sure the victim can feel that way. And I would not blame a victim of something that someone did to be like, you know, fuck them. Mm -hmm. Like that's a different story. Right. But when we're talking about the general public trying to take sides on a story like that, when it's like a death, somebody just died. Like, I just don't, and I think we, we creeps, kind of creeps me out a little bit. Yeah, it, it, it's disturbing. And I think we fail to see ourselves in under that same lens. You know, what if what if this was me in this situation? Good, bad or ugly. You know, would I want the same kind of um, uh, penalties right. hanging over my head for something I did or didn't do? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I but to your point, I know, you know, one thing that w everybody can tell about Kobe, and I, and I jokingly say I was not a fan of his play. I was not a fan of his play because I was not a fan of the Lakers, and he <laughs> tends to win a lot, and so that's kind of problematic <laughs> when you're not <laughs> a fan of the team. Um, but one of the things that no one can contest was the guy's work ethic, and that's kind of one of the things that I see in you. Um, and and you mentioned in one of your posts on social media that it's, it's sh helped shape the person that you are in many ways. What are some of those things that you take away? Uh, you know, you hit it right on the head. I think the first thing is, is it's it's a lesson that I actually learned from my parents, um, and I saw that in him, and it, it, it really helped me. You know, it's different when you see it on a big stage. For and, sure. And the lesson that we had as kids were, you know, always, I, my mother used to drill this in my head every morning, that you have to be the hardest working person in the room, no excuses. Um, and that's just something that I carried with me at all times. And to see this young, brash kid come out of high school and, you know, struggle at first, but never let it affect him mentally and, and always came out to work hard. You know, you hear stories of guys going to practice in the gym at, you know, six o'clock in the morning and Kobe's been there for two hours. Yeah. Dripping, dripping sweat. You know, he's already been putting in the work. And, and this is a guy that wasn't afraid to work hard and, and go above and beyond to be the best that he could be at his craft. Yeah, and, and that that's an interesting thing because I've always believed that you are born with that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but also, you're a sales trainer, mm -hmm. and you have to not only train people on how to do the right thing, but motivate them into maybe, uh, and you, you correct me if I'm wrong, but why should they get up to do this thing or why you know what what makes sense about working hard at, at this particular craft and um you know guys like kobe i think make such a good argument for like you're born with this mm -hmm. guys like jordan um you know we can go down all the you know top athletes you know for the most part like those are guys that are obsessed with this greatness even after they've already achieved it absolutely um, and that's something that you see in all the greats. It's it's not something that's unique to Kobe or Jordan. If you you look all the way down the list, if you see the ones that are the top of the mountain, Ray Allen, Ray Allen, yeah. Ray Allen had the famous thing that if he ever m if he missed a, f a free throw, he would stay. He would come to practice earlier than normal, and he would not leave until he make a hundred consecutive free throws. And so he would start making free throws. He would fail in 96, count would start back over. Like, That's obsessive. That's, that's crazy. <laughs> that's just absolutely crazy. But like, uh, my guess is that he wasn't taught that. No. You know, I don't know if that's a nature versus nurture. I don't know if it's a chip on the shoulder. I don't know if you're born with wiring in your brain. I don't know what the argument there is. But So I think when it comes to athletes, and I, I love – that we've been going down this road because I think athletics and sales have actually a lot in common. And I think when you look at athletes, there is different groups. So you have the people that just have this 
God-given talent where, you know, if, if you watch a video of LeBron James in high school, it looks like he's playing with my kids. Yes. It's just not fair. <laughs> you know, his kids are very young. <laughs> <laughs> They're little. <laughs> and, you know, this guy is in high school and he's six foot eight, 240 pounds yeah. running around like a guard. You know, I remember the, the center on my high school basketball team was six foot eight and was not running around like a guard, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, so that is just something that, you know, he was touched. You know, he yeah. just has that gift. And then you have people that whether or not they have that that extra, they have this, you know, like you said, I think you said this this wiring. It's something different, something that makes them want to be better, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's better than themselves, better than the person next to them. They have this this internal drive. And, you know, to your point, that's something you can't teach. Mm -hmm. You can kind of, you can try to push it and, you know, and, and enhance it, but it's, it's maybe unlock it, unlock it. Uh, that's a good way to put it. And I think when you see these elite athletes, the Kobe's, the Jordans, you know, the, the Tiger Woods, it's when you combine those two things, they got it all. And you have those two things together. You're unstoppable. Yeah. You know, Cause you, you have the talent and you're not wasting it and you're, you're pushing to be better than you were yesterday. Um, I, I've always been critical of a lot of the motivational rah-rah stuff. <laughs> um, particularly, I like what you do because you're a trainer, so you're teaching, you, you teach people nuts and bolts. You're not just telling them they're beautiful and they're, they can accomplish anything they set their mind to, you know, like. Because you can't. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, so yeah, that I always <laughs> say, well, I want to dunk from the free throw line. <laughs> can I do that? I don't think so. Um, and so... Tell me a little bit about the difference between what you do and what would be sort of like the classic, um, you know, like a motivational speaker guy that you see in YouTube or in Instagram. So um, the way I like to, to categorize it, you know, I, I think I'm a little bit of a sales trainer. I'm a little bit of a motivational speaker. So I say I'm a sales evational speaker, mm -hmm. which is kind of a little bit of both. Um, and I think you're, you know, you're right on the head. That's not something that, uh, that, you know, yeah, I'm not going to be able to train Mario on how to dunk from the free throw line. That's right. not that's not happening today. But how can I take your talents that are already there, your skill sets that are already there, and how can I get the best out of it? You put the rim at an eight feet <laughs> level. <laughs> exactly. I'm going to move you a couple <laughs> feet closer, <laughs> and we're going to put this tramp right here. Uh, <laughs> and sometimes that's it. Maybe that's the trick. Maybe it's tools. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's tools and tricks. And how do I how do I take person A? and get the absolute best out of them. One of the things I love to see is, it wasn't until I became a sales trainer, you know, we have this idea of what people are as, as, as salespeople. You know, it's it's the extrovert, it's the loudest person at the party, the person that's ready to talk to everybody, and that's what we assume a salesperson is, mm -hmm. right? And don't get me wrong, that's those are your top level salespeople more often than not. But as I started to travel around different cities and different companies and different industries, I realized that, wow, there's a whole broad spectrum for salespeople. And in fact, there's a big chunk of salespeople that are the opposite of that, that are introverted and they're not the you know the life of the party. But there's something in them that can make them successful in sales as well. So my job as a sales trainer and part motivational speaker is how do I unlock that potential? Because we all have it. Now, how do I take that potential and, and get you to operate at your absolute maximum? Now, if I can do that, if I can unlock that potential for the introvert or even take that person that has that natural skill and dial it up a notch, then my job is, you know, done and I've done what I'm here to do. Is, is that potential something that everyone has or is there people that you go and you train and you spend time with and you go like, nope? <laughs> so I think um, I haven't, I've, I don't know that I've come across that yet. Um, I think where where i love the sales and sports analogies um there are moments where it's different and i think you know to your point we're gonna go back to that one uh, there's only so much i can do when it comes to athletics physically like we are going to hit a cap you know whatever right. it is um where i don't have that in sales necessarily because at the end of the day when i talk about sales it's really about um the art of conversation it's really about getting in and out of conversations with people um, understanding them on a deeper level, opening up yourself, getting them to open up. Um, that is something that anyone can do. Um, right. So, so I guess it would, it would be something like, you know, going back to the athletics example, the, the rules in athletics are created purposely to make a challenging level playing field. Most of the time, I think that's what rules in athletics do. Like that's the, their purpose is to try to make fair play 
happen. When you get to sales, there's no such rules crafted. Sales is just, you know, going from a point of interest, I would say, to closing a transaction um, and, you know, and how that happens doesn't really have any preconceived rules. You're able to use somebody's talents to kind of weave their unique path. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, and that's that's a big part of my training is, is, is understanding where you fit in that, you know, on that scale. It, if someone is, you know, a very jokey personality, and then I want to use that. And I want to, of course, there's a time and place for it, right? But Sure. But I want to use that as a strength. And I think what a lot of trainers do is they try to fit you into their mold, which, you know, maybe one out of ten, it's a, it's a perfect match and it's great. But for the other people, that's that's something for me, even as a salesperson, I struggled with that mm -hmm. um, early in my career. It's because I, I by no means was a natural salesperson. It's not something that came naturally. And I tried to fit myself in these molds of the people that I saw, whether it was the, you know, the author of a book or the person doing a seminar. And I tried to fit that mold. And it was it, it was me fighting against my programming. You think the reason that people are trained to fit in one box is that is it a lack of nuance on the trainers or is it that the clients have gotten or the customer has gotten sophisticated faster than the trainings? So, you know, um, it used to be like the classic salesperson, what's what you describe, outgoing personality, doesn't take no for an answer, doesn't get easily offended, doesn't have a problem getting rejected a thousand times a day, understands the numbers game behind sales. Um, but but as time has gone on, it seems like that sales guy has kind of caught the bad rap. Mm -hmm. Hence, we use, you know, we say, you sound like a used car salesman. That's <laughs> a, something that everyone says, you know, not disrespect to used car salespeople. But that's not meant as a compliment when someone accuses you of that or says that to you. Um, and I think, like, to your point, sales have become more sophisticated. Absolutely. Because maybe the consumer is more sophisticated. They have access to more information. So you can no longer, um, you know, say things that are outlandish because by the time the customer comes in the lot, they know what the miles per gallon are. They know the crash rating of that car or, or whatnot. Absolutely. And as a former used car salesperson, <laughs> I've heard that one a lot. I'm sure you have. <laughs> um, but you're, you're absolutely right. I think we're in a unique age where our buyers are more educated, more, um, you use the word sophisticated, um, they're more savvy than they've ever been. Um, and in a lot of cases, they know more than we do, which is a scary time for salespeople and for that type of salesperson that you mentioned, the days are gone where we were the gatekeepers of information and, you know, a customer came in and I knew no matter what I said or did, they need me, mm -hmm. you know, and those, those times are over. So a, a customer now has an ability to say, you know what, I know exactly mm -hmm. what I want, what I'm looking for. Now I'm shopping for the right salesperson. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's where, uh, you know, sales in general has been turned on its head. And I think a lot of people are, kind of floundering trying to figure out where we fit in this new sales world. Uh, but I think that w we don't have to rely on those tactics anymore. Um, I think that we can relax a little, and I think this opens up a space for more types of sales personalities uh, to come into what we do and just share themselves with a the customer. Because at the end of the day, if, if I'm having a good dialogue with uh, the person in front of me, you know, I'm more, more likely to open up and, and buy. Yeah, I think for a long time what happened is for those personality types, that became a crutch to not having to be very uh, resourceful with your research and your knowledge base. Mm -hmm. And what's happened is there is no substitute for that now. Absolutely. Um, and so... You know, to your point, I'm actually um, in our brokerage. I'm teaching a class, and <coughs> I was trying to figure out what to call it. Um, and so I've always heard in real estate people say things like, fake it till you make it. And <laughs> nothing bothers me more. Like, it, it literally, whenever someone says that in the hallway, I'm like, ah, it gives me the heavy jibbies. And it was, it's, I, I realized it was simply because it's crap advice to people. It's crap advice. You're enabling someone to stay without knowledge yep. and forge ahead in that profession instead of saying, this is not that complex, okay? You can learn the nuts and bolts and, and you can get to like, I think to become an expert on something, there's that, that book that is the 10,000 hour rule. 
um, that, you know, to become an expert, you got to do something for 10,000 hours. And going back to athletics, you know, one of the things about Tiger Woods is like in this book, they to go through athletes and Tiger Woods, because his dad started him at such a young age, he hit that 10,000 hours and he was like seven years old, you know. <laughs> so, you know, there is an advantage to that. But, you know, you can get to a pretty high proficiency level, especially in real estate or, or in real estate related sales, you know, you can get to 70, 80% proficiency probably within a couple of months mm -hmm. of like some good studying, some curiosity, some reading, some, some good classes. And then listen, the other 20% takes 10 years to get there. So don't stress over it. Just keep doing those activities that guide you to that 70% or 80%. And so I call the, the class face it until you make it. I love it. Just keep, keep confronting this lack of knowledge because knowing your shit will trump a good personality Absolutely. and knowing your shit will trump um, a lot of the things that people have used, salespeople have used as crutches over time to kind of make a living. Absolutely. And I think um, to your point that fake it till you make it, not only is that, um, first of all, horrible advice, but it's also still falls under that category of we need to trick the customer because right. we're faking it till we make it. So. What are we faking? Are we faking that we care? Are we faking our product knowledge? What, what are we faking? So uh, the whole philosophy behind it, I, I think, is, is off. And I think we can totally look at this a different way. And to your point, me as a young salesperson, again, I didn't have that natural ability. I didn't have that mm -hmm. charisma. But I was the studier. I was the, the learner. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I could I could absorb information and I was, m you know, manic about learning. Mm -hmm. um, so I was the um, the 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 person with the product knowledge that's mm -hmm. where my strength always was and I remember early in my sales career that was you know something I was almost laughed at because it was who was the strongest closer right who could close the best and who could oh I tricked this customer or I got them you know that's where we got yeah. that used car wrap and you know who can who can trick the customer into buying and you know that never sat well with me in the first place um, and I think you know I I if I know my stuff I know my product and I take the time to get to know the customer my process is a lot easier. The customer walks away feeling a lot better, and, and it's something that's duplicatable, and I don't have to fake it. What What do you think is the role for salespeople going forward? Like, as if you had a crystal ball, and you had to look ahead in time, because you know we we've already kind of covered that salespeople were the gatekeepers between you and that thing that you wanted, so you had to go through them. Um, now, salespeople are not so much the gatekeepers. Um, in many ways, they are the experts. So whether it's giving the consumer new information to reassure them of their decision or whether it's giving them information that confirms the, dis the knowledge that they already have, that's sort of the role of it, of the salespeople. But a lot of technology companies would like to think that you can cut out the salesperson in the future. So like in specifically in the case of real estate, that seems to be a worry industry-wide by a lot of people. How do you see that playing out in the future? You know, you're absolutely right. I, I've gone to IBS now, the International Builder Show, the last two years, and for most companies, that's the move. It, it seems like they're trying to push salespeople out of the equation, um, which, you know, I think that's a big no-no. Number one, I think um, these processes, especially when we're talking about real estate, it's still a very emotional, you know, right. purchase. Uh, you know, people can tell you, and I'll, I'll argue, with someone until you know my, my head falls off that it's not a logical decision. You may justify it logically, but it's an emotional decision. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when the salesperson is, is most beneficial. If we know how to adapt our style and become that person, like you said, that is a confidant for the buyer, that can help walk them through the situation, that can confirm things for them, and, and just make them feel okay about making some of the decisions that they're making. Um, but if we stay stuck in our old ways, then we will get passed up. And if you look at other industries, I see, you know, I'm driving down the road and I see a car vending machine. Yeah. Uh, that scares me. Yeah. That scares me because, uh, you know, that's that's something that you thought would never happen. And, and you know, there, I, I hate to see that happen in other industries where, you know, we as salespeople get weeded out because we refuse to adapt, you know. Yeah, I think... I think there's two different mentalities. I think first is the mentality of the people that are that want to do the pushing out, that they're um, they're just looking at a zero sum game, uh, it's a game saying if we push out the salespeople, we save that overhead and we still make the transactions happen. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so in that regard, it makes it becomes a logical decision for McDonald's to put kiosks for people to order instead of having people at the registers. But I think to your point, the, the, the bigger the purchase or the less frequent people make those purchases, the more likely they will need a real advisor, um, someone to be with them with it uh, or through that process. Also because people have complicated lives of their own. You know, people do more today than they ever did. I think it's hilarious when people are like, all people do is go be on their phones all day long. And I'm like, there's a multitude of things people are doing on their phones nowadays. Like, I sent out like 20 emails today. If I had to do that 30 years ago, I would have had to go spend my morning at the post office. You know what I'm saying? Like, and dip in your quill in the, in the ink. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, it's it, it, we have more time because technology has allowed us to do a lot of tasks much quicker. And so people now, you know, work out more or they're more involved with hobbies or they may take off a, take on a, a painting class or a guitar lesson or whatever. So maybe learning about that one purchase that they're going to make every five or seven or 10 years is not really that interesting to them. Very true. Very true. Um, you know, and I, I think what we have to do is make sure that um, as, as a salesperson that we adjust our role. Um, because you talked about it before that the used car salesman stigma um, ha has been around forever. So that's why I feel like that it was very easy for that industry to say, we're going to move on from salespeople. Right. Um, and that's something that I'd hate to see happen. Number one, you know, in, 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 the, in the real estate industry, new homes and, and, and resale. One thing that's funny with the car world is at the same time that you see those vending machines, there's another thing happening, which is I have several friends that use car brokers private car brokers to find them cars. Mm -hmm. I never heard about that 10 years ago, 15 years ago, but nowadays really good car salespeople have branched off and done this thing where they are car brokers. And so if you're looking for a specific vehicle, so, you know, you want a, an M3 and you want it on this specific color with this specific transmission and this options, you call one of the car brokers and you say, hey, this is what I'm looking for. And that guy's job becomes to hunt that car. Mm -hmm. And there's still, you know, there's still, it, it, that's the, the salesperson that understand this. There's still art to, yeah. to what we do. Um, that the, the computers aren't there yet. Yeah. Um, and if we maximize what we do as salespeople, where we're, we're helping the customer, we're, we're sometimes we're educating the customer. Um, but in, in most cases, we're helping them get to a solution. You know, maybe you're looking for that M3 in this color with this mileage, but I can talk you into, you know, maybe one a year older mm -hmm. and a different color. Maybe that's where my expertise comes mm -hmm. in and says, hey, if you go with this year, you get the twin turbo, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's where my expertise as a salesperson comes in and, you know, help guide the customer through this process. Yeah, I there's a l there's definitely, um, I think, a lot of room still for, um, salespeople to exist and thrive, but um, you definitely got to be an expert on whatever area you're in. You can't you, you can't cut it with being the gatekeeper thing anymore. <laughs> That's not going to work. Not in the days of car vending <laughs> machines, right? <laughs> and you can't fake it till you make it. Yeah, you cannot fake it <laughs> until you make it. Um, when it comes to the motivation side, what do you think are some of the challenges that you see the most with people and motivation? Like what are what some of those roadblocks that you 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 see people have to um, get over to really be motivated? I think the the first thing I see most often is it is something that is hard for people to get past mentally. It's foreign. Um, you know, I, I I come from a household where we were very big into motivation. Um, my my mother used to get, leave me a little motivational post it notes on my mirror. So it's something that we were. Before Instagram. Before Instagram, yeah. Now she just tagged me. <laughs> my, my, my mother's very big on social media. Um, but, you know, I would get little post-it notes of, you know, reach for the stars and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it's something that was always in, ingrained in me from day one. And I think, uh, it un unfortunately, that's not common anymore. Uh, so the first... It never was. It never was, exactly. So, um, And I think the older in time you go, the less common it was. Absolutely. It, you know, for a lot... For a very long time, I think it was the opposite. You know, instead of motivating people, we tried to break them down. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, it's like, you can't do that. <laughs> Why are you picking up that soccer ball? You you got big feet. You You're know? never going to make it. Yeah. Go 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 back to the steel mill, right? Yeah. So I, I, it, I think it's getting past people's own mental limitations. 
Um, what I noticed is, you know, I love that you said the word roadblocks because in, in, in my speakings, I noticed that a lot of people's limitations are their own. They're not, they're, they're not real. They're perceived mm -hmm. limitations. So it's how do we get you past those perceived limitations that you think are there? A and I think, unfortunately, you know, we talked about this. We, we are in a, an unprecedented age of social media. And, you, you know, you have those two camps where people are faking it, so they make it. And then you just have a lot of negativity out there. So I think a lot of people spend all their time living in the negativity. And that's one of the things that I learned early on. I had a, a great mentor and a friend of mine, Oscar, told me early in my sales career, um, you know, and, and one of the things I talk about big is mentality. And I remember I, I came in one day to work and I just must have had a look on my face. I don't know what it was, but he said he pulls me aside and I'm training a group of guys. That I think I'm rocking and rolling. And he pulls me aside. and He says, what's wrong with your face? I'm like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> this is the face I was born with. And he goes, no, something's wrong with your face. So he pulls me outside and he says, listen, I don't know what's going on at home. I don't know what's going on in, in your world. But I know that you not being in the right min mindset is not going to fix it. And a kind of a light bulb went off for me. And he, he said, listen, when you pull up in the parking lot, whatever, you know, money troubles you're having, whatever, you know, lady troubles you're having, whatever mm -hmm. car troubles you're having, I want you to write it down, put it in an envelope and stuff it in your glove box. He said, I promise you those problems will still be there at the end of the day. But while you're here, you need to be laser focused. And it was like a slap in the face to me, like, oh, man, if I'm not dialed in as a salesperson every day mentally, my day is shot. Yeah, it, it, it'll compound. Oh, sure. It'll Absolutely. compound the problems. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, mentality has just always been big. It's always been around me. So that's one of the things that I try to preach more than every anything else. You know, I tell people that you got to let the negatives roll off your back because you just sitting and, and, and living in those negatives are not going to fix them. So uh, sometimes you just got to take them on the chin and, and, and keep it moving, um, which is really hard for most people. Um, I, I, th I think you see it a lot on social media. Something bad happens in someone's life and they're posting it within 10 seconds. The world collapses. Everything is over with. Yeah. And it's to me, the sad part when I see that is that that tells me that person doesn't have anyone else to reach out. Like it's such a cry out for help. And the sad part about it is just that that person doesn't have someone to pick up the phone to have a conversation about their bad day. And that sucks too, because mm -hmm. everyone should have a person like that. Absolutely. So my goal is to make all of us um, a little bit mentally tougher mm -hmm. um, to where we can process some of those negatives. And then, like you said, is to surround yourself with a good circle, you know, to I like the that. right people around you. I like that because what you're saying is not, you're not going to have problems. What you're saying is not, I'm going to teach you how to fix those problems easier. What you're saying is mental toughness mm -hmm. is sort of the discipline of understanding problems will always be there. You will always have them. And no matter how big or small, you have to learn how to cope with them in a way that doesn't affect your day to day activities. Absolutely. If you look at me as a s as a motivational speaker and if you look at me as a sales trainer, they're, they're one in the same. Uh, my, my whole goal is, you know, like you said, problems are going to happen. What you do with that problem is what's going to make or break you. So if you let that problem crush you then, you know, we, we might as well pack it in. But if you can process that in a, in a healthy way and, and you know, pocket it and learn from it and move on, then th that's going to that's gonna take you a long way. So if you look at my sales training and my motivational speaking, there's no quick fixes. There's no, hey, say this and you're going to get a sale or, hey, do this mantra in the morning, you'll never have a bad day. That's just not realistic. But it's how can we develop those skills and build up that, that mental toughness that can carry us for the rest of our lives. Yeah, and I think I think there's a big difference when you're saying building up a skill. It's a very different thing. So I always say this. So when you hear a really good motivational speaker, full of shit as they may be, <laughs> you get kind of a jolt of something. Like you like it's like a drug. Don't you drink know, the, you don't drink the Kool-Aid. Yeah, you it's like you drank the Kool-Aid <laughs> and you're now like, "Woo," you know, like you're on it. And I noticed this um, many years ago when I first got introduced to that world, that you would go to one of these things or they would send everyone in the company to one of these things and everybody would come fired up and they would come up, come back. And for a couple of days, it was like awesome. Mm -hmm. And then it goes down. And so that's why I compared to a drug because you have to keep going back to the source yep. to continue that emotional high because you're not building a skill 
you're just getting a, getting an adrenaline shot every time you go through it and so you know that w- that was always one of kind of my my things with motivational speaking is like it's not that i don't believe they motivate you they do for a short period of time until you go to the next one and that's why the number one predictor of who goes to a motivational class and who buys a motivational speaker book is whoever's bought one before or whoever's gone to one before absolutely and so th- you know that tells me that it really is a good business to keep people hooked but it doesn't offer uh, a solution based approach in learning how to handle things in a way that's going to be constructive and it's going to be able to um, build solutions for the long term absolutely it, and you know they're they get caught up in the ether mm-hmm. and unfortunately that wears off if you look at these most of these uh training seminars and and uh, you know it's the base best place to to sell product right right because you're so caught up in the high and yeah you know whether it's sales or motivation whatever it is you know that's gonna wear off you're gonna get back to your office and you're gonna talk to a client and you're gonna get that first no to your face and it's boom back to nothing you know back yeah you're to gonna be like oh where is it <laughs> he said that wasn't gonna happen yeah so, uh and it, it you know reality comes at you quick and it wears off and, and then you're back to where you started and then you think to yourself oh maybe i just need to go again you know yeah and then there's this other thing that is the sort of a newer one which is the motivational speaker that just kind of berates people that's <laughs> that's a newer one which is i think it's interesting and i've always said I don't know if I've always said, let me rephrase that. I feel now, today days, that everyone has a part of them that craves discipline. And so if, you know, if you read Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life, he, you know, one of the things is the whole clean up your room thing, which is actually not the rule, but, you know, that's what he's known for. And it's just bringing order to your life. It's a good way to begin a journey for, um, meaning a meaning translates to happiness and it kind of goes in that order but i think like especially our generation it was kind of like the first one with you know both working parents and sort of like a little more laissez-faire parenting where the parents were your friends and <laughs> discipline kind of went out the window a little bit and so now you see people paying to these guys to get screamed at like a <laughs> drill sergeant because they crave that discipline um what do you think about that? You think discipline is something that, that maybe salespeople can use to better themselves or to benefit themselves? Um, you know, I think, I, I think the discipline is very important. I think it has to be a part of the equation. I, I don't know that it should be the driver because um, discipline is not going to take you all the way there. You need that, right? So if you look at your top salespeople, um, they have that discipline. Um, they may not be organized, <laughs> But they have the discipline. You know, they know when to make their calls. They know when they have to do this and that and this and that. So the discipline is important. Uh, but I think, you know, if we start with the mentality, above and beyond the mentality, if you can get your, your brain wrapped around what we do as salespeople, if you can get yourself in the right space mentally, it's going to take you a long way. Now, if you can add that discipline in, now you're now you're off to new heights. So that kind of goes back to the, you know, the athletes. You know, it's it's. You know, nobody told Ray Allen that if he misses that free throw, he needs to shoot a hundred more. Yeah. And we don't even know if it helps him. Have no clue. But that's his discipline. That's that's what he needed to get himself to the next next level. And I believe up until recently, he was the he, he held the record for um, for uh, free most consecutive. Yeah. yeah. And a free throw percentage until, you know, that kid Steph Curry passed him. But <laughs> he, he's a freak. <laughs> yeah, it, it's um, the discipline question. I think it always comes up. And I think because. People see a lot of movies, you know, like Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross or whatever. Mm-hmm. They they want to get kind of stuck on those like famous speeches about always be closing and like the, you know, hard, tough talking sales guy who's super disciplined or whatever, you know, like to the almost to a fault. And and listen, I, to your point, discipline certainly helps things, but um I think it's also that people something that people will acquire um, the more they enjoy what they do. Absolutely, absolutely. Because then the discipline doesn't feel like work. Right. You know, it's it's part of it becomes part of your process. Yeah, it's like working out. Absolutely, absolutely. Because yeah, you, you, you know, you know, me and you talk about exercise often, and it's not. It, it doesn't feel like discipline. It just feels like part of what you do. Well, I mean, what I my my analogy to that is always that if I could put in a little bottle, 
the thing that I feel after I run 10 miles or 14 miles or whatever, or bike, or whatever, if I could put that in a bottle or in a pill and take one, I may not exercise at all. <laughs> you know, like that, because it feels so good afterwards. I've never met anyone that finished a tough workout that said, shit, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> never. Like it's I the mean, opposite. Yeah, it's the opposite. People are like, man, I'm glad I did that. Yeah. Man, I got out of bed for that. Like, and people sometimes think like, that, that when you wake up in the morning, like for me, people sometimes, you know, because I spend a lot of time running, you know, people are like, oh, I hate running. And I'm like, what do you think? I love it. Do you <laughs> think like when I put on my shoes and I have the next two hours of my life, I'm going to be turning these legs. You think at 37 years old, like I feel like this is going to be a, you know, a good experience. N not really, but I know the end result is going to be good for me and I'm going to feel accomplished. And there's sort of like a, that mental dopamine that comes with ha having done something difficult, something you struggled with, um, that that I think it's it's very valuable for me at least. I, uh, I don't know about other people. And, you know, and I'm the same way as you know, as, as you know, I'm you know, I have a pretty crazy schedule. So most most mornings I'm up at you know 4 a.m. as Dwayne the Rock Johnson would say, and I, yes, I still call him the yeah. Rock. <laughs> I still smell the Rock is cooking. Um, you know, I'm up at 4 a.m. in the gym clanging and banging as he would say right yeah. and i you know everyone assumes when they talk to me oh you're you're a morning person i hate mornings yeah <laughs> but it's part of my routine you know it's 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 not discipline it's i mean it is discipline but i don't see it that way it's it's part of my routine i get up i go do what i got yeah do. and listen a lot of times i'll go out you know thinking i'm gonna do a six mile run and you know they sort of like uh my lazy side creeps <laughs> up and four miles in, I call it quits and I, I come back home and people are like, oh man, you ran four miles. And I'm like, it was meant to be six. <laughs> you know, it's a not a good day. You know, it's not a good day today. But literally every time I look at my shoes and I'm putting up my shoes, like I, I don't really want to do that. I want the payoff. I want what happens when I'm done doing that thing. And to me, um, you know, I, I love guys like David Goggins and the Cameron Haynes of the world, guys that are out there, like these are savages that are pushing themselves, running 200 miles and, you know, doing like this very crazy feats of humans, you know, of human endurance. Um, and I see people kind of imitate that. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, just take a step back a little bit. Those guys didn't get there yesterday. Mm -hmm. And if you try to get there tomorrow, you're going to hurt yourself and you're never going to want to do this thing again. So it's better to kind of build up with consistency over time to be that, you know. Yeah. And then, you know, you, you set goals along the way and you, you once you accomplish those goals, there's nothing like that feeling. Right. Uh, to, to accomplish something that you thought at one point was not impossible, but, you know, certainly very difficult. And once you accomplish the goal, it's, you know, that's that's the best feeling in the world. Yeah. Well. I think this has been an awesome conversation. I'm glad we finally got to record <laughs> one of these because we've had a few of them. Um, um, Corey, tell everyone how they can reach you. Um, I have your Instagram page up. If you mind if I show your Instagram page here no, real please quick? please go for it. Um, if you want to follow Corey and kind of get a little bit more of an insight on what he posts, wh how he talks, um, you know, it's very motivational stuff. Right now it's kind of taken over by... Uh, Mr. Kobe Bryant, uh, but uh, for the most part, you'll see a lot of motivational stuff, a lot of um, a lot of meaningful information that I think everyone in this industry could use. Corey, thank you so much for being here today, buddy. Thank you so much, sir. It's been a pleasure. All right.